Judges chapter 13 through 16, we're talking about one of the most interesting characters in all of the Bible, Samson. How many saw that old movie with Victor Mature and Hedy Lamarr? And uh, there may be other renditions as well, but um, Samson is certainly a colorful character and he offers us many examples, mostly negative, about what not to do. And yet we're going to also see that as sinful and self-centered as he is, God's going to use him. I knew somebody once who was sinful and self-centered, and uh, I saw him recently, actually in the mirror this morning. And uh, I think it speaks of all of us. And uh, how many of you can say the same thing, huh? I think about a third of us can, okay. <laughs> By the end of the message, all of us will. Uh, we're going to look at Samson's birth his uh, special, special calling as a Nazarite and as a judge. Uh, we're going to see in chapter 14 his wife, a Philistine, a heathen. We're going to see his victories in chapter 15, and then we're going to see his very sad and tragic end. And we're going to see that Samson basically lived for Samson. And we're going to see, and the Apostle Paul talks about that, Referring to our walk with the Lord, he says, in him, referring to God, we live and move and have our being. Samson would say, as would our old sinful nature, in me, I live and move and have my being. Very sad, but a lot of lessons for us and hopefully we can learn from it. Let's uh, ask God for help. Father, we ask you to open our ears and our eyes, spiritually speaking, help us to really understand how to live for you and others and not just ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Joy, J-O-Y. Jesus, others, yourself. That's the order. That's not the order for Samson. So in uh, chapter 13, we see he's born to very godly parents who fear God. They pray and they believe in God. And God promises them a very special child. That child is going to fulfill the promise that God has for him, and he's going to be a Nazarite. Now, the Nazarite vow is found in the book of Numbers, and God said that a Nazarite vow might be for a period of time. The Apostle Paul took that for a short time. Uh, it could be for life, and Samson's going to have a Nazarite vow for life, and he's not to partake of wine uh, or anything from the vineyard. He's not to cut his hair and he's not to touch any dead bodies. And we're going to see that that is not something which Samson follows, uh, at least as far as the hair being cut in his tragic end, and as far as touching a dead body. But that's what God said, you're to be separate. And he speaks to us in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, and he says to us, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So we need to be separate unto God. It does not mean we don't work with other people, but we need to be careful that we're not taking on the world in its form of any sort, its ways. And uh, let's see now how this develops with this very special child. Judges chapter 13, let's begin with verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. The book of Judges has a theme, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And isn't that the essence of sin? Isn't that the world around us? Isn't that the world within us in the old nature? Doing what we want to do. And that's what he was doing and that's what the nation was doing. Well, the nation is sinning and then God puts them into slavery. In this case, it's going to be the Philistines. And then they cry out to God for a deliverer. He sends the deliverer. The deliverer gives victory. Uh, the people are happy. They behave themselves for a short time. And then they sin again. Now, in the past, we've seen judges who have been raised up and who have led uh, the nation or a couple of tribes in victory over their enemies. Here, we're going to see that basically, Samson does something which is the essence of sin he tries to do it all on his own. He senses God's calling, but he tries to do it not in the energy of the spirit, but in the energy of his own flesh. And that's something we have to watch out for as well. We know the calling. We know what we're supposed to be doing. 
But many times we either don't do it or we approach it on our own, doing it our way. And that's going to be the example of Samson. And when you look back over this whole story today, you're going to see that Samson couldn't lead anybody. He didn't lead anybody in the nation. He couldn't even lead himself. And yet he had extraordinary strength and ability. What a waste. And let's begin now with verse 2. There was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites. So it's the tribe of Dan. His name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her. Now whenever you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that refers to Jesus Christ. He is very active in all periods of the Old Testament, especially here in the book of Judges. This is not the first time that he has appeared to a family to raise up a judge. So the angel of the Lord, or Jesus, appeared to this woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, can you imagine how joyful she was? Being barren for such a long time, and in that day, to not have children was a curse. And in all generations, for some, it's sad not to have a child. But then it was definitely a curse. And for her to hear that news, she's going to have a son, must have brought great joy to her heart. Now therefore, and these are the instructions, please be careful not to drink wine or a similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. Remember God had given them certain animals that were clean and certain ones were not clean and they couldn't eat uh, pork and they couldn't eat uh, shellfish and on and on. Well, she had to observe that. Even today, when ladies are pregnant, they're told not to drink alcohol and perhaps other substances as well. Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So you're not to drink any wine, don't touch anything that's unclean, uh, whether it's food or eating it, and never allow this child to cut his hair. Now God's promising here in verse 5, there'll be deliverance from the hand of the Philistines. Now the Philistines were a pagan nation, a people in what is now the, uh, right by the Mediterranean Sea, and they would cause great trouble for the nation of Israel. And we know that Goliath, the historic figure whom David felled, came from the Philistines. And they caused great, great problems. Well, verse 6, the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or a similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So that is to be a full, lifelong commitment of the Nazarite vow. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who shall be born. And that's the right attitude to take. First of all, the wife is going to the husband and telling him the news, which is what should happen. I kind of wish that Eve had done that, don't you? When Satan rang her doorbell and said, why don't you eat that fruit? She should have at least talked to Adam about it. I'm not sure the result would have been any different than what we have today, but a wife should go to her husband uh, for counsel and direction, and a wife uh, should also be a wise counselor for her husband too. They should work together as a team. Well, Manoah is praying now for more insight, and that's a very wise thing to do. When you feel that God is speaking to you, and you feel you need more information, ask him. Ask him, what shall we do? I feel there's a calling to do this or to do that. Give me more direction. It's a very, very wise person that does that. And James tells us, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he'll give it to him liberally without reproach. But let him ask in faith. So Manoah is asking for more direction. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. 
Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. Now she doesn't know who this man is, but she knows he's special and she's willing to listen to him. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, capital M, he said to him, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. I love that. Every time I see Jesus saying I am in the Old Testament or the New, I think about that time on Mount Sinai when Moses says at the burning bush, who shall I say has sent me to deliver us from Israel, from Egypt? He says, I am, the great I am. Well, Manoah said, now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So he's asking for specific directions. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. So there's this idea of separation, this idea of abstinence, this idea of holiness. Now, Manoah, verse 15, said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. So at this point, Manoah knows that he's a special messenger from God, but he doesn't really know he's talking to God himself. And so he wants to follow typical uh, courtesy of that time, and every culture has its own form of courtesy. Uh, they didn't have any restaurants to go to. They couldn't go to uh, Dunkin' Donuts for a meal. So they had to prepare something right at hand. So let me have a young goat prepared for you. This reminds me of the time when Abraham, much earlier, saw three men coming and he also prepared a meal for them. And two of those men were really angels. The third was the Lord Jesus again, the angel of the Lord. So a meal is about to be prepared. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. So I'm not going to accept this as a meal, but I will accept it as an offering unto the Lord. Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name? seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord. He did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the Lord or the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. So here we see a wonderful picture of a preview, a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins. Here we see the Lord is saying to him, you're not going to offer me a meal, but you offer a burnt sacrifice to God. Now there were different kinds of offerings the Jews had to offer, and a burnt offering was just as you might imagine, taking the sacrifice, that animal, burning it up completely, making sure that by the next day, nothing was left at all. It's a total, complete consuming of that body. And it speaks of the fact that Jesus would be our complete offering and he would give his life totally for our sins. So they're going to be making a burnt offering. And what does Jesus do? As the flames of this offering are going up, he ascends right in the very flame itself, indicating that he will be the fulfillment of that offering, that burnt offering unto God. John the Baptist told his disciples upon seeing Jesus one day, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is our Lamb, our burnt offering, our sacrifice. And one of the most wonderful things you can do is study the names of Jesus. Go on the internet and type in that very thing, names of Jesus, and you'll see over 100 names of Jesus in the Bible. And one of them is this word in verse 18, wonderful. Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Now here he may be using it as an adjective to describe the name. It's a wonderful name. 
But Isaiah talks about it in the form of a noun. His name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so Jesus is wonderful, but his name also is wonderful. Amen. So you can call somebody, your spouse or somebody else, wonderful, but with a small W, right? Only Jesus has that capital W. Well, they knew this was special. And they, did, they saw this wonderful thing in verse 20, the flame going up, Jesus going right up in the flame, and they fell on their faces. They were worshiping now. And the angel appeared no more to Manoah, and then Manoah knew that he was, in fact, the angel of the Lord. Well, Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. And that might be a logical conclusion, but thank God for the wisdom of his wife. His wife said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. So, honey, don't worry. He could have taken us, but he didn't. He wants us to fulfill his promise. So the woman bore a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanah Dan, between Zorah and Eshtol. So here's a young man with a special calling. Special because God has chosen him. And God is beginning to move on him. Notice that the Spirit of God is moving upon him for a purpose to deliver the nation from the Philistines. And even though Samson is going to show us his fleshly side, and really, if we got to know all these Bible characters, we would see the same thing, we need to be careful in our own lives because we like to judge. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the first time, but to save. But I like to judge, don't you? I like to be judgmental and be critical and put other people down. That's the old nature. That's the competitive side, the evil side. But we're not to do that. And we need to see here that even though Samson's going to fail in many ways, the Spirit of the Lord is moving on him, and the Spirit of God is using him. And so we need to be careful not to criticize one another, because to do so will be to criticize God. What we should do is pray for each other, and even go to each other and point out mistakes and sins, but not to judge. So the Spirit of the Lord is moving on him. That's all we need to know. He's God's chosen vessel. Now, chapter 14, we're going to see here that Samson is doing something which is not good. He's defying his parents in regard to marrying a heathen woman. And we're going to see that that defiance is going to typify his life. One of the reasons God says to have the children obey the parents is not just to have order, which of course is necessary in a family, but to teach those children obedience. As they learn to obey their parents, they learn to obey God. They learn to obey authority. And if you go into the prisons anywhere, for example, you're going to find a number of people, all of whom are sorry they're there. Some truly are repentant, others are just sorry they got caught. But there's a common theme. And I would guarantee that in every single case, there was not a person who was truly obedient to family, truly obedient to authorities. That's why they got to where they are. And so we need to watch out in our own lives as well. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And it's the one commandment of the 10 that's with promise, that your days may be long upon the earth. You're going to live long when you obey your parents. He's not going to obey his parents. Therefore, he's not going to be worth a whole lot to the nation of Israel. Now we're going to see also that he defies God's word. He's defying his parents. He's defying God's word. And he knows that his calling is to not touch a dead body. He is going to touch the dead carcass of a lion that he has killed just to get some honey out of it. And then he's going to give that honey, the product of a sinful touch, to his parents and then cause that sin to spread. And then he's going to make a riddle about it. We're going to find that this incredibly powerful man is in many ways very silly. And we find that sometimes is the essence of sin. I don't care how grand we are in the world's eyes. We can become very silly. There have been people who have been very wealthy who become eccentric. 
uh, one in particular, worrying about his fingernails and worrying about bugs and germs and stuff. Uh, and so without the Lord, we can become very, very foolish. And Samson's going to typify that for us. And uh, I think the lesson here for chapter 14 is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Samson is going to show himself to be chosen by God, but also a fool. He's despising wisdom and instruction. Chapter 14. Now Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So she's a heathen, she's a Philistine. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now this is interesting because he is going to marry an unbeliever. And God's word was very clear to Moses, you're not to mingle with the foreigners. Paul says to us, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't associate with an unbeliever in terms of that intimate relationship or even in partnership because light cannot exist with dark and Satan can't exist with, with uh, Christ. So this is definitely a move of his flesh. He's not listening to his parents. He's disobedient there. And um, yet it indicates that this was of the Lord. And that's very, very mysterious for us to understand. Does it mean that God changed his mind, that he wanted him to marry an unbeliever? No, I don't think he's saying that. God never changes his mind. Is God saying, don't listen to your parents? You're an exception, Samson. He never changes his word. But what he's saying is that even though Samson is going to disobey God's word about going after a heathen gal and not listening to his parents, God will still use that for his purpose. There's that free will, sinfully carried out, and yet the will of God to bring about his purpose. Look at Judas. Did God want for Judas to betray Jesus? No, but he used it as an occasion to put Jesus on the cross that you and I would have forgiveness of our sins. So here's this wonderful scripture that even though we do things wrong and even though we mess things up, God can still work all things together for his purpose and his plan. It's not an excuse for us to go out and do wrong, but if we do and we mess everything up, we come to him and say, I'm sorry, he can still put good together out of it. My mother used to say that although we scramble eggs, God can unscramble eggs and still make it right. You can get sunny side up out of scrambled eggs only with God, right? So now he's going to uh, want his will. He's got authority over his parents. Do you think this is the first time he told his parents what to do? Oh, I think he's an expert by now. And uh, many kids are, and that's very sad. Because when are they going to learn obedience, if not from their parents, uh, from the coach at school, from the teacher, from the police officer? Hey, the employer is just waiting for a disobedient child to come and tell the employer what to do, right? I want to find that job. And so uh, they're going to have trouble. They're going to have serious, serious uh, problems down the line. So anyway, God's going to use it because he wants to really get victory over the Philistines. So he goes down to uh, Timnah because he wants this woman. And now verse 5, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. And he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So in this surprise encounter with the lion, young lion, but still a strong one, He's able with his bare hands to rip this lion apart. We see, first of all, the strength of this man, this unusual strength, and we also see the spirit of the Lord is upon him. So don't forget God in all this. God is giving him that strength to do it. And uh, whenever God calls you to do something, he'll give you the strength to do it. 
God's calling is God's enabling, and he'll enable you to get that job done. Well, he didn't tell his parents that he had killed this lion, and that's important. He then went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands. Remember, that's, he's now violating that command. Remember, don't drink wine, don't cut your hair, don't touch, any, touch anything unclean. And so this dead animal is unclean ceremoniously. He has now taken this honey from that carcass. And he came to his father and mother, and he gave some to them. And they also ate, but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. One of the problems with sin is that it spreads, and we spread it. And I don't care what that sin is, unless we confess it and ask the Lord to forgive us, we're going to just give it to somebody else. Even sins that are done privately without anybody knowing about it. When you and I sin privately and the world doesn't know, we know, we begin to sense a separation from God, a separation from others. Somebody calls me on the phone and says, pray for this or that. I'm in the midst of sin. Uh, call Pastor Henry. I'm kind of in sin right now. I need to enjoy this and then get back with the Lord. I'll be open tomorrow. And so that's not going to work. We're going to have to always be open to represent the Lord. We can't afford that downtime, can we? Well, he's now letting it spread. This uh, is sinful because it's a command of God being broken. Don't touch the body. And now this, this honey is being given to the parents. So that's the trouble with sin. It's wrong in God's eyes. It's wrong between God and us. And it's wrong by separating us from others. And, sh and they begin to partake of it. It's not a good thing. So the father went down, verse 10, to the woman. He's uh, complying with the demands of his son. And um, they're going to go ahead and try to get this wedding together. So Samson gave a feast there for young men uh, used to do that. And it happened uh, when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. So this is kind of like a bachelor's party. So they bring 30 of these Philistine young fellows to be his attendants, if you will. And Samson said to them, let me pose a riddle to you. So here's this man who's supposed to be a a future deliverer of Israel, and he's a rather silly fella. Um, he's going to have a riddle now. He wants to have a little fun. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And they said to him, pose your riddle that we may hear it. So this is a feast, and the feast often lasted uh, seven days. No doubt the one that Jesus attended at Cana was more than a couple of days, and they just ran out of wine. So he, of course, performed that miracle of making more. But it was not uncommon to have a seven-day feast. I'm looking forward to a seven-year feast. How about you? After the rapture, while the earth is in tribulation time for seven years, those who are in Christ are going to be in heaven for a seven-year feast and the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we're going to return with the Lord in our resurrection bodies to live here on earth for a thousand years in the millennium. Well, here's this riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days, they could not explain the riddle. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? So they don't want to give up their 30 changes of clothing, do they? So they make a very straightforward deal with her. Find out the riddle, or we're burning you and your dad alive. Okay, that, that'll get their attention for sure. Well, Samson's wife wept on him, uh -huh, one of the great tools. <laughs> she wept on him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. You have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And he said to her, look, I have not explained it to my father or my mother. So should I explain it to you? Shows you his priorities right there, right? <laughs> Mom and dad come first and they're not going to get it, nor are you. So he, like every other man, says, I'm not going to be fooled by those tears. I am stronger than this. 
Now she had wept on him the seven days while their feast lasted, and it happened on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. So she finally got the answer after continual weeping. So here's this man who has incredible physical strength, but he does not have the moral strength, uh, he doesn't have the emotional strength that would be required to resist her. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. So now he's ticked. They've solved the riddle and he is angry. And so what's he going to do? Verse 19, the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. He went down to Ashkelon, killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, gave the changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused and he went back up to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So here we see this silly pastime about the riddle. We see how he gives in to his wife and gives the answer. And then he gets angry and then he goes out and he kills 30 of these Philistines to get their clothing. And that seems frivolous to us, and it really is. But notice these words, the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. And that's why this is not so easy to judge. In the natural, I think this is foolish and silly and a waste of time. But in the spiritual realm, God is using it in order to have an occasion to defeat the Philistines who have been keeping uh, Israel pressed under their thumb. So as we're about to judge other people and say you're a believer but you're silly and foolish and frivolous, you probably better go into prayer and say, God, are you in this in some way? No, it doesn't mean that he was necessarily right in going out and killing these 30 men, but God used that occasion against them. So it's not so easy to judge. We need to really get our face in the carpet, ask God to judge us, and give us wisdom on how to approach somebody else who's doing something that we think is frivolous or silly. Well, chapter 15 now is going to continue. He is, uh, remember, he is called by God to break the stronghold of the Philistines on the nation of Israel. He has rather interesting ways of doing it. We saw already killing 30 men just to get their garments. Um, I don't sense in Samson at this moment or at any moment any sense of his mission of leading the nation of Israel. I don't think Samson ever sees beyond Samson. And that, of course, is a picture of the old nature for sure. And yet, even though he doesn't see beyond himself, God is still using him. I don't think God can use me when I'm thinking about myself only. But you know, God can still use me and he can still use you. Now, he doesn't want us to be selfish. He wants us to get beyond ourselves. But God is working even in unsuspected ways, even in our sinfulness, because he'll still carry out his purpose. All right, chapter 15. He, uh, Samson is victorious in destroying the enemy's crops and some of the enemy. But he loses his wife and is given up to the enemy by his own people. He will judge Israel for 20 years, but he can't govern himself. He acts alone without leading others, and he has a strong ego. And he's, uh, we're going to see that in the naming of a certain well that he has. He's all about Samson, and yet God is using him. Chapter 15. After a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. Remember the wife he left behind? Uh, he kind of visited her uh, like he's on vacation or something, but he, he got angry, he killed those guys, got their clothing, and then he took off. Um, he didn't know that she's been given now to his best man. So he goes back to see her. What a surprise he has. So he visits his wife with a young goat. He said, let me go into my wife into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. Now, he's been gone for some time. But he comes on back and expects to just pick up where he left off. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and he caught 300 foxes he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. 
When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and olive groves. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Etam. So certainly his method of leading Israel and overcoming the Philistines is unique at best. So we find here he wants to go back to his wife. The wife's been given to his best man. Now he's angry. So what does he do? He finds these foxes. And I've tried to picture this in my mind many times. Ever try to catch a fox? Five years ago when I was teaching this, I had just seen a red fox a couple of days before that flying across the trail so fast that my four dogs didn't even spot that fox. Can you imagine trying to catch one fox and then another fox, tying their tails together, getting a torch, lighting the torch, making sure the tails contain the torch, and then you do that 29 more times with a total of 30 pairs of fox and uh, all these torches and then turning them loose into a field and the vineyards and destroying all these crops. And uh, it sounds incredible. It sounds to me very frivolous and silly. Uh, you ought to go out and get a good job instead of playing games like this, I think. Uh, and yet, God is using him. So that's the mysterious thing. God is using some very interesting techniques. So we've got to be careful about judging. Um, well, then they get angry at him. And um, they, they want now to have revenge. So they, they burn down his wife and, and um, the... Uh, the family. So now he's angry at that. You know how this tit for tat and this anger keeps going and going. You did this, I'm going to do that. So now he attacks a, a large number of them and uh, hip and thigh, he has a great slaughter. And so it looks to me like he's just working out of the passions of his own flesh. And yet behind the scenes, God is working. God is making a statement to the Philistines and to Israel I will not allow the Philistines to oppress my beloved people. So he's there in the cleft of the rock. Now the Philistines, verse 9, they're going to try a different approach. They really cannot handle Samson straight on. So they've got to find help. The Philistines went up and they encamped in Judah. And they deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? So what they're going to do now, the Philistines are smart. They can't get Samson, so they're going to go out and they're going to threaten the tribe of Judah. And Judah's saying, what are you bothering us for? They said, we've come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. So Judah is going to now help the Philistines to arrest Samson because they don't want the Philistines to destroy them. Notice how many men they send to get Samson. Verse 11, 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, they don't go down to take him, they go down to talk to him. So do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? You see, the Philistines have been in, in charge of the whole nation of Israel. And yet God is using this rather silly, powerful man named Samson in a strange way. So the Philistines are over us. He said to them, as they did to me, so I've done to them. So that's his answer. <laughs> They got me, I got them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand. We will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. So he's going along with this. We'll see how this all plays out. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. But ah, here's the, the uh, spirit factor. Verse 14, the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. So the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And incidentally, we've seen that a number of times today. 
That was something that was done in the Old Testament. When God was going to use somebody, the Holy Spirit came upon that person, and then at the end of that period, the Holy Spirit left that person. That's why David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. But once the Holy Spirit came upon the church in the book of Acts chapter 2, he indwelt the believer, and I don't need to say, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The mighty, powerful Holy Spirit is always within me and upon me and upon you as well in Christ. So thank God for that. But here the Holy Spirit's upon him. He breaks the ropes uh, like uh, as if they were just burned by fire. And now he's ready to go to town. He came up to Lehi and they were shouting, these ropes are burned. Um, and uh, he found a fresh jawbone, verse 15, a jawbone of a donkey. He reached out his hand, took it, and he killed a thousand men with this simple jawbone of a dead donkey. And then, of course, he has to have a little poem about it. My, my little uh, poet here. Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Who has slain a thousand men? I have slain a thousand men. In me I live and move and have my own being. Where is the sense of God with this man? And yet God is using him. And so it was. When he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi. That means jawbone height. Then he became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and said, you have given this great deliverance, so he now acknowledges God. You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi. Water came out, he drank, and his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore he called its name en Hakor, which is in Lehi to this day. And that means spring of the caller. And he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. So here is a man of great passion, anger, revenge, uh, certainly incredible strength, uh, the Holy Spirit upon him for a great victory. And then, as we are when we're tired, I'm thirsty, I'm going to die. Oh, if I don't get some food, I'm going to die. And that was the way it was uh, in, in several cases in the Bible where we get exaggerations because we're tired and we think the end has come upon us. And um, we find that with um, the, uh, the, the twins of Rebekah, when you've got the, the two boys there and you've got uh, uh, Jacob and his brother, what's the brother's name? Esau, and Esau comes in from the field, he's hungry. Give me your stew, Jacob, or I will what? I'm going to die. I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. We get like that sometimes. We get cranky and, oh, life isn't worth living. Oh, take me off the scene, Lord. I can't, I can't live anymore. Um, I was like that many times. I get so depressed, so dark, and so heavy. And my mother would say, honey, did you go swimming today? Oh, mother, you don't understand the complexity of my life. Take a swim, honey. Call me later. I take a swim. Oh, life was good. The endorphins were flowing, and uh, life was good. <laughs> Uh, I'm working with somebody right now who gets very cranky. He's a young fella, gets very, very cranky, very miserable. But all, we go to Taco Bell and all is good afterwards. You see, <laughs> that's the way he is here. So he's, got his, he's now ruling for 20 years. Now the very famous story, we all know about that. And uh, you can see that old movie with Victor Mature and Hedy Lamar. see how that all works out. Samson and Delilah, chapter 16. Samson's downfall comes again through sinful passions. He yields to Delilah. He falls quickly, loses his hair, his strength, his sight, his liberty, his usefulness, his testimony, his life. In 20 years, he fails to totally defeat the Philistines, and he's defeated instead by them and really by himself. So Samuel, actually, Samuel is going to accomplish more in one prayer to defeat the Philistines than Samson does in his whole life. We're going to see that in 1 Samuel. Samuel is going to pray to the Lord, offer a burnt offering, and God will totally defeat the Philistines. So verse 21 is going to show us in this chapter the blinding, binding, and grinding results of sin. Samson and Delilah, chapter 16. 
Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it's daylight, we will kill him. So he decides he wants to have a little fellowship, so he goes out and gets a harlot, and um, he's enjoying himself, and the fellows in the city uh, of Gaza say, let's wait until morning, and then we'll jump on him. Well, Samson lay low until midnight. He was smart, and the Holy Spirit's probably tipping him off. And he arose at midnight, and then notice how frivolous this is. He took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So here he is uh, in action with the harlot. He doesn't want to get killed by the people of the city, so he waits until midnight, most folks would just slip out of town. No, he's going to take the gates with him, the doorposts, and he's going to carry them all the way up to the top of the hill uh, of, uh, that's facing Hebron there. So um, he certainly marches to his own drummer, and many times that drummer is not the Holy Spirit, but sometimes it is, and we have to be careful not to judge. Verse 4, afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So verse 4 indicates it's a different woman. There are those who have said that Delilah was a harlot. No, the harlot's in verse 1. Now, this is a gal named Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means he may overpower him. We may overpower him uh, to bind him, to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. A lot of money. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Samson said to her, so he has a sense of humor. He's again, rather frivolous. He likes to play games. And so he said, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, that I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the, big, in the room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, and he's still having some fun, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, that I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off as arms like a, th as arms like a thread. So then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, so she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web of, from the loom. So she's working on him. He's had this happen to him before, hasn't he? Remember his wife was weeping for seven days. He finally gave in. Look at the pattern of sin in our lives. Is that the first time I have yielded to that sin? Probably not. And did I notice the same telltale signs as I was going down that road? Probably not. So here we tend in the area of sin to have certain patterns, certain areas, and we become very prone to that and uh, very weak in that area. So that's what's going on here. And also with sin, it tends to get closer and closer and closer to our door. It's seven bowstrings, then it's ropes, and now it's the hair, and it's getting close to the true source of his strength. So that's what happens with sin. It keeps working on you and working on you, and you finally give in if you're not careful. So verse 15, she said to him, here it goes, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. So now he's starting to succumb to her ploys. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. 
He just couldn't handle the vexing of his wife, or this woman. So he told her all his heart and said to her, Here it is. No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Finally, he gives in. Now the strength is not in his hair. The strength is in the obedience to not cut his hair. There is the critical point. Just like if he'd had a glass of wine, the same result. If he had uh, touched the dead body, which he did. Um, so it's obedience, not the hair, that is the answer here. And he's now been disobedient. And when you're disobedient, you lose the power of God in your life. Purity is power. So, verse 18, she knows she has the answer. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the Lord of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. She lulled him to sleep on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Seven locks. Seven is the number for God, the number of fulfillment and completion, indicating the complete fulfilling of the promise to not cut the hair and to honor God. Now that's gone. She said to the Philistines, or said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. In one of the saddest verses of the Bible, he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He didn't know it. And when you and I sin, we're disobedient, we don't know that the power and the glory of God departs from us. And the only way to get it back is to confess that sin and call upon the Lord for forgiveness. Verse 21, this is sad. The Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. That's where I had my lesson here. This verse 21 shows the blinding, the binding, and the grinding results of sin. But God's grace is always there. Verse 22, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. So if you would find yourself in verse 21, blinded, binded, and grinding, there's still that confession, turning to God, and a new and fresh day. So now the hair is beginning to grow. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. You see, the problem with sin is that the devil gets the glory. When you and I fall and fail, people say his God can't deliver him. And so Satan gets the glory and they are the gods of one's making instead of the living God. Well, the people saw him. They praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. So here he is, kind of like a trained bear. How sad. This great man of God now just being a pathetic figure uh, before these people. And so it is with you and for, for me. As we sin, having done much for the Lord, we become a pathetic figure of what once was. How many have fallen from their ministries, from the pulpits, and from whatever, when they were used so mightily of God, and then they really were good for nothing. So he now is performing like just some animal in the circus, and they petitioned him, they stationed him between the pillars. Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. 
And so here we see again the sad picture of a man who, even at this moment, blinded and bound and grinding, can't think about his country, can't think about others. I want to do this because of the vengeance and revenge for my two eyes. He never gets beyond himself, and yet God uses him. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. Rather sad story. A sad story about being able to be used by God, but never getting beyond flesh, never getting beyond self, caught up with frivolous activities, tying foxes' tails and setting torches on fire, and um, just grabbing a donkey's uh, skull and just bashing the enemy, just anything to get back and to live by the, the flesh, the passions. And yet, even in that, God is compassionate, God still uses us, and so we never discount ourselves, and it's important not to discount yourself. If you and I are caught in sin, confess it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And about the time that you and I think that we're good for nothing, we've failed God, we have failed others, and our lives are hopeless, as we turn to God and ask his forgiveness, that can be the most powerful time spiritually of our lives. I find when I fail and I ask God to forgive me and my nose comes out of that carpet, I have no sense of self, I have no sense of my value, I realize that without the Lord I'm nothing. And there are two verses that govern my life. One is John 15, 5, based on this experience. The Lord says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When you and I realize that, we're in good shape. I can do nothing without the Lord. But Philippians 4.19, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Use those two verses for your life. Without you, Lord, I'm nothing. With you, I can do anything. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this story about Samson. A sad story. A sad story of self and of such potential frivolously wasted in so many areas the job not completed to take care of the enemy because he was so caught up in his own flesh. But Lord, we are not accomplishing all that we can or should do. And so the time that is left for us, Lord, must count. As C.T. Studd once said in his poem, only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. Help us to take the time left, Lord, and use it for the glory of God, not for self. Joy, Jesus, others, yourself. May that be the order of our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.